right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's preview of the Center for Railroad Photography and Arts latest publication, Continuity and Change, The Lure of North American Railroads, presented by the book's editors, Alexander Craighead and Scott Lotus. My name is Haley Page, and I'm the Center's Exhibitions and Events Coordinator. Um, to begin, as usual, I'm going to just run through some quick housekeeping information on Zoom's controls. Um, so we use Zoom webinar for all our presentations, and that means you, the audience, do not have access to your personal audio or camera during the event. Um, but you can change how you like to view the presentation um, in the top right corner of your Zoom screen under the view, uh, the view icon. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a number of other icons. Please use the chat, as many of you are doing right now, for any comments you have during the presentation. Um, it's always great to see where everyone's tuning in from, so keep that coming in. Um, and if you make sure you select everyone um, so everyone can see your comments. Um, and then please use the Q&A function to submit any questions you have for our presenters following the presentation we will host a Q&A session. Um, so just make sure that you put that question in the Q&A, not the chat, um, so that we're able to just get our eyes on that. We're, we really won't be checking the chat um, regularly for the questions during the Q&A. Uh, we will be recording tonight's program and everything will be made available on our YouTube channel early next week. I'll just drop the link for our YouTube channel in there. Scott, do you have your cute little uh, card? It's youtube.com slash rail photo art. Here it is. Um, <laughs> Probably unmute so that I can talk and people in my screen pops up and people can see us. So all of our programs at youtube.com slash rail photo art, including this one, just as soon as Haley puts it there. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so tonight's presentation is just one of many that we've hosted over the last two years. Um, and you can check out all of those presentations as well as videos that we've posted from our online conferences on our YouTube channel, um, that same link I just dropped in the chat. Our next presentation will be on Tuesday, September 20th, and we will be interviewing the winners of this year's John E. Gruber Creative Photography Awards Program, and we're hoping to set up registration for that pretty soon, so stay tuned for that. Everything we do stems from our mission, our mission to preserve and present significant images of railroading, and we do that through online programs like this one, our in-person conferences and events, and publications like our beautiful beautiful quarterly journal, Railroad Heritage, which should be hitting mailboxes in the next few weeks. I think that's going to press this week. Is that right, Scott? <laughs> um, and books, uh, which includes Continuity and Change, which we'll be talking about um, tonight. Pre-orders for that are available now, and we will start shipping books on September 1st. You can pre-order books on our website right now, dropping that link in the chat. Um, other things we do, I mean, we have an archive of over half a million images, we do our annual awards program for which our next uh, online presentation is going to be about, and we put together traveling exhibitions. Members um, support all of the work we do. If you're already a member, thank you very, very much. You literally make possible everything we do. If you're not a member, we do hope you'll consider joining, um, and you can do that on our website. I'm also dropping that link in the chat right now. Um, and with that, let's get on to tonight's program. So our presenters tonight are Alexander Craighead and Scott Lotus. Alex is a curator, photographer, essayist, and historian who writes about the intersection of technology, representation, and landscape. His work on railroads and photography has appeared in the NRHS Bulletin, Rail Fan and Railroad, Railroad Heritage, and Trains. His first book, Railway Palaces of Portland, Oregon, was published in 2016, and he is co-editor of the Center's um, Railroad and the Art of Place and Anthology, which was the publication we released last year. And he was also curator of After Promontory 150 Years of Transcontinental Railroading, uh, which was an exhibition the Center put together in 2019. He has a PhD in architecture and teaches geography and American studies at UC Berkeley. Scott Lotus joined the center in 2008 and became our full-time executive director in 2011. Two years later, he was named president and editor of our journal, Railroad Heritage. His interest in railroads and landscape came from his childhood in West Virginia, and he took up photography while attending college at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. His writing and photographs appear frequently in trains, classic trains, rail fan and railroad, and other publications, and he has worked on seven different books about railroad photography. 
His latest contribution is a joint effort between him and our other presenter tonight, Alex. Continuity and Change, The Lure of North American Railroads is our latest publication. It explores the photography of contemporary railroading in North America through 230 photographs and 13 essays that dig into topics on railroads and nature, pathways of commerce, passenger railroading, heritage activities, workers, international connections, and how the passage of time marks both railroads and photography. In tonight's program, Alex and Scott will take you behind the scenes on the journey of both developing the concept of the book and realizing its final production. That I'll turn it over to you guys. Well, thanks, Haley. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, before I start sharing my screen, I am just going to hold up the book once again. It is not a small book. It's about six and a half pounds. It'll give you a good workout, and uh, but we're, we're, we're really proud of it. And I also just have to show off the fact that among the book's many features, we have eight of the these beautiful fold out pages where we're able to run a horizontal image all the way uh, across a folded page without going through the gutter. And these include extended captions on the reverse. Uh, they're really elegant and uh, hats off to our designer, Jeff Browse for coming up. Uh, but it does make for an, a little bit of a large book. So you want a, a big table to uh, view this on or a nice comfy chair. Yes, and please don't so with that, those pages when you too excitedly open them up. <laughs> yes, yes, be careful. <laughs> we don't we don't offer replacements for uh, overly enthusiastic openers. Yes. All right. Well, let me share my screen, and then we can get this train out of the station. Let's see. Does that look good, to everybody? Looks good. All right. So as we've already said, our new book this year is Continuity and Change, uh, The Lure of North American Railroads. Its official publication date is September 1st, which is when we'll start shipping it. Uh, we began taking pre-orders on July 28th. And tonight we wanna give you a behind the scenes look at how this monster of a book came about. Now the roots of Continuity and Change are a natural extension of our previous book, uh, the most recent one, the Railroad and the Art of Place, an anthology, which was conceived by David Kaler and published last year. As I mentioned, Jeff Browles lent his superlative design talents to both of these projects, which gives them a, a nice visual continuity of look and feel that flow together almost seamlessly. Now, The Railroad and the Art of Place focuses on place, and its perspective looks around at the railroad landscape and then backwards. On the other hand, continuity and change focuses more on time, uh, specifically the 21st century, looking around at the railroad and then forward. In a way, we can think of last year's book as deliberating on where we are and how we got here, while continuity and change explores what we do and where we are going. While working as one of uh, several editors on the Railroad and the Art of Place, I had the pleasure of numerous discussions with Scott about the state of railroad photography. During one of those conversations, we came to the conclusion that there were two major schools, if you will, uh, to rail photography today. Um, one, as we explored in the Railroad and the Art of Place, grew out of the contemplative consideration of the railroad environment, inspired by a long tradition of American fine arts photography. Examples include the Stieglitz photograph here of, um, from 1902 on the upper right, the hand of a man or Walker Evans' mid-1930s image of Edwardsville, Mississippi at the lower right. Yet alongside of that is a strong sensibility that was influenced by two distinctly different traditions. Uh, one of these is photography commissioned by the railroads themselves uh, in the last two centuries, commercial work that spoke to broad audiences through advertising and helped to shape the railroad and the popular imagination such as this circa 1880 image of Marshall Pass in Colorado, which was made by William Henry Jackson for the Denver and Rio Grande. The other tradition, equally potent, is that of photojournalism, found in the pages of newspapers and mass market magazines throughout the 20th century. A fine example of this, this spread of photographs we see here by the photographer Bernard Hoffman uh, which shows a night run of a new Santa Fe fast freight. And this appeared in the March 1940 issue of Life magazine, one of the biggest magazines you can get into. Uh, photojournalistic work of this sort 
prioritized subject matter and style served narrative. Combined, these two ancestries influenced a kind of photography that is dramatic, dynamic, and deeply concerned with the arresting of important moments in time. Scott and I quickly realized two things. Uh, first, that these traditions are important and they deserve considered attention from the center. Second, that a book focusing on these traditions would not compete with the railroad in the art of place, but rather complemented. As we thought more about it, we realized these two volumes together would cover nearly the entire spectrum of contemporary railroad photography. And that we at the center explore um, this sort of broad spectrum and that they would almost serve as a kind of capstone for the center's 25th anniversary. So in mid-2020, while we worked to complete The Railroad and the Art of Place, uh, we also began to lay out the concept of what would become continuity and change. Now, while we knew a little about what we were setting out to do, uh, to make a book of photography by contemporary working photographers who were depicting the railways of the 21st century, we really didn't have much more of it than that at the time. And there was also the challenge of co-editing this project. Alex and I have been friends and colleagues for a long time, but we also have distinctly different aesthetic preferences. See if you can guess which of these two photographs is mine and which is Alex's. Uh, hint from Alex there. <laughs> and while such differences could help us challenge each other's thinking, we also realized that we needed to find a shared vision for this project. So for, inspira um, <clears throat> so for inspiration, we both turned to our bookshelves. Simultaneously and entirely independently of one another, we both selected the same book as a possible guide for this project. And that is The Lure of Japan's Railways by Naotaka Hirota. If you're not familiar with this book, I cannot recommend it more highly. It was published in 1969 and its images remain as fresh, dynamic and exciting today as they must have been back then, now more than 50 years ago. Those of us who know Hirota's work sometimes call him the Richard Steinheimer of Japan. And this is the two of them in a 1990 photograph by Jeff Browse, taken when Hirota traveled to California to meet Steinheimer and see American railroads. Hirota's photographs, as well as their presentation in the lure of Japan's railways, are bold and fearless. Most images cross the gutter, and the compositions are incredible. This is a two-page spread of a steam locomotive driver taking a double-headed express train across the snowy mountains of Hokkaido. The concept for this book was equally bold, an English language publication to introduce Japan's railways and Hirota's photography of them to audiences around the world. Well, it's a tall order, especially in 1969, and we're lucky that Japan's leading English language newspaper, the Japan Times, took on the task. The resulting book is visually stunning, uh, in part because Hirota managed to capture a moment of change in high contrast. Uh, this was a country where it was possible to ride some of the most modern metropolitan transit systems in the world, the busiest subways in the world in places like Tokyo in this photograph, but also a place where it was possible to ride behind considerably less advanced power, um, such as this horse-drawn milk cart out in the countryside. And I just have to emphasize here that Hirota took both of these photographs in the same year. What Hirota seemed to capture so well was this sense of immediacy, uh, the sense that time was his real subject and the trains were his way of noting it. Change itself was accelerating rapidly, and with his camera in hand, Hirota sought to arrest this change, to make it visible before it disappeared behind the next change and the next and the next. Did you change the slides? Hmm. Oh, Should no, I this is the right slide, okay. 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 Minor <laughs> technical details, moving on. Um, so as we faced a tall order ourselves um, in trying to present the entire North American rail network in a single book, um, even one as enormous as ours turned out to be, we needed guidance from a book with similarly high aspirations. And the lure of Japan's railways became our common touchstone for working through our challenges. Uh, there are, of course, obvious differences. 
Um, Herodotus' book is a monograph. It's one person's work. Um, and Herodotus took all of its pictures in just six months. By contrast, we knew from the beginning that we wanted to feature work from as many photographers as possible. And while we want our book to clearly represent the present, I should put little air quotes around that, uh, we knew we could never limit ourselves to such a narrow time frame. Still, there are many parallels, and the first two paragraphs of Herota's introduction really crystallized them for us. I'm going to read these. This is what Herota wrote. He said, Japan has two faces. One is represented by the historical temples and shrines wrapped in a deep serenity, uh, wrapped in a veil of deep serenity, the gently undulating mountains, the other by the flaming flu stacks of the petrochemical complexes, the whir of jet planes, the ultra-modern high-rise buildings that soar skyward in rapid succession. Likewise, the Japanese railroad has two facets, the new and the old. The former is typified by the super express trains of the new Tokaido line and the high performance commuter trains that run every two minutes or so. The latter by the outdated railroad service which has paved the way for the modern, the powerful steam locomotives and the humorous yet pathetic provincial trains. Paging through Hirota's book again, we realized that every photograph in it serves the purpose of presenting these two facets the new and the old of Japan's railways. It does this through 12 tightly focused thematic galleries. They make no attempt at a comprehensive presentation of Japanese railways. By not trying to do that, I think the book is more successful at its ultimate purpose, which is sharing something of the essence of Japan's railways at a particular moment in time. Time is at the heart of both the railroad and photography. Time governs railroad operations, and time describes every photographic exposure. The passage of time turns the new and the exciting into the everyday and the commonplace, into the old and the endangered, and finally into the gone and remembered. As Alex and I thought more about this and about Hirota's book with its laser focus on the old and the new, we realized that what bound together the photography of the 21st century railroad was the paradox of continuity and change. But time is tricky. Changes can be lumpy, uh, moving so slow that they're almost unnoticeable until we pay closer to attention, uh, me, closer attention to them. Um, I, I think one example, uh, which appears in our book, sums up this effect quite nicely. Uh, seen here is one of the most famous photographs of a train in North America. Uh, this is a 1954 image made by Nicholas Morant at a small roadside overlook near Lake Louise, Alberta in Canada. Morant was a commercial photographer who worked for the Canadian Pacific and alongside this image he made hundreds at this location alone. As a result, this photo and the many that he made like it became part of mass culture, used by the CP in numerous calendars, brochures, and advertisements throughout the 20th century. It is such a part of popular culture that the place took on the photographer's name. The place now is named after the photographer. Uh, to this day, it is Morant's Curve. And this is not just to rail enthusiasts, but to the general public. Uh, it is not, it is so well known. Uh, excuse me, that Parks Canada, uh, who manages this area, issues official guidance for how to get to this spot and make your own Morant's Curve photograph. Which brings us to images such as this. This is a 2017 view in the same spot. It's made by Nicholas D'Amato, and this photograph won first place in our Creative Photography Awards that same year. Uh, these two images are at the same location, but separated by more than 60 years, and yet they could not be more different. While both photographs show the Canadian Pacific's premier traffic, the nature of the traffic has changed radically. For Morant, it was a luxurious passenger train, the Canadian. For D'Amato, it is a hotshot intermodal train carrying containers and truck trailers from the ports in Vancouver. The technologies of photography have also changed radically, with different aesthetic results. D'Amato testifies to how night images have become far more practical with the advent of digital photo sensors. 
The Rockies stand in sharp relief against a darkened sky, while at their feet the motion blur of the red end of train device, which is itself testament to the absence of cabooses, is also an example of how photographers faced with ever more visually homogenous trains have placed more and more emphasis on motion and movement, a stark contrast to photographers such as Morant, who had wanted to freeze moving trains to present them to the public in perfect clarity. To assemble our book, we cast our net wide. Sometimes we directly approach photographers that we knew that we wanted to include, but most of the pool of images came from a call for submissions that we published far and wide in late 2020. Uh, we asked photographers to send us images that address the challenges of railways and nature, of railroad workers, uh, passenger trains, intermodal connectivity, and anachronisms that still existed. And the response we received was overwhelming. We had more than 3,000 or almost 3,000 images uh, and close to 150 different photographers who submitted in a space, I should add, of about three months. Would, trust me, my email box is on fire. <laughs> um, as an editor, I can tell you that this was a source of both joy and pain. Um, joy because we had such a rich pool of materials to select from, but pain because we knew from the very beginning we didn't have space to include the vast majority of them. It was tough to go through rounds of edits over the course of 2021, as Scott and I reduced and reduced and reduced until we get a volume down to a reasonable size, um, although I'm not sure the post office agrees with us. Um, even then, we ended up uh, with a whopping 384 pages. Um, and even then, we only had room for less than 10% of what was sent. So ultimately, we organized the book into 12 thematic galleries. Uh, initially, these were based on the 12 galleries in Herodas' book. Uh, some were loose some were more closely. Uh, as we continue to work on the book, to our astonishment, this arrangement not only worked, but it sang to us. For the rest of the presentation, uh, we're going to run through these galleries, uh, each of which consists of several photographs plus an essay, uh, six of which were written mostly by me and six of which were written mostly by Scott. Uh, I should add that we intentionally did not sign the essays because we often were contributing to each other's work. Um, Due to time constraints, of course, we can only share a handful of selections, but we hope they will give you a sense of the book. And then after that, we'll turn to some questions, uh, starting with a few we have for each other, um, and then opening up questions for you from the audience. Uh, so as a reminder, if you have any questions as we go along, uh, feel free to go ahead and dump them in the Q&A. Uh, don't wait to the end. Just put them in whenever you feel like it. Um, we'll address them when we get to the end of the program. So we open the book with a foreword by Bon French, our chairman, uh, who reflects on the center's first 25 years. This is our 25th anniversary this year, and it's paired with his brilliant photograph of this SD90 locomotive pulled up to the Shell Station in Clifton, Arizona, a lovely juxtaposition of technologies there. We then encounter the first of our 12 galleries, which we call With and Against Nature. And this one explores the dynamic tension between railroads and the natural world sometimes in graceful harmony with each other, other times in combative opposition. Now, this lead image by Jim Pearson shows a Norfolk Southern train entering a deep cut near Ramsey, Indiana. And we also look at the role of weather and the challenges it presents to railroad operations. This is a Tom Klein photograph showing a Kansas City Southern train passing an electronic billboard warning of a major storm forming the Gulf of Mexico. And this photograph by Chip Sherman closes the section. Uh, when I first saw it, I found it kind of absurd and humorous at the same time. Uh, my first thought was that this is a Looney Tunes cartoon, uh, something featuring the Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote with its rocks the size of small houses. Uh, yet it's sobering too. It's a view of nature that is powerfully and violently reasserting itself on Colorado's Tennessee Pass route. For all their power, the railroads and ultimately all of humanity are just temporary visitors in this natural world. So from there, our second gallery is called the Path of Commerce. And in this one, we examine the current state of what moves by rail. Richard Koenig opens this section with a photograph in Utah's Echo Canyon, showing the sometimes competitors and sometimes collaborators, both trucks and freight trains. 
Inside, we step through many of the major rail commodities, uh, starting with coal, the oldest and biggest. And this spread features coal strongholds on both sides of the continent, Wyoming's Powder River Basin in the west by Chris Walters, and a modern mine in Virginia uh, on the right there by Will Jordan. And Will's photograph is one of eight foldouts in the book, which I already just, uh, demonstrated. They allow us to showcase large landscape images without crossing the deep gutter in the book. And they also provide for those extended captions on the reverse. These were costly additions, but we're pretty excited. After coal, we look at the movement of other products, including petrochemicals, general merchandise, and grain, as seen in this spread with photographs by Lou Bleidinger, Justin Franz, and Alex Silka on the right. Here, as in other chapters of the book, we did not shy away from showing aspects of the railroad world that were challenging. Uh, we've already mentioned the difficulties of nature, to which we can add the ups and downs of economic cycles, as seen in the locomotive deadlines, or in cars stored to wait out for sessions, as seen in this 2009 photograph of stored well cars on the Red River Valley in Western made by Lou Bleidinger. And that extends to counterculture communities who continue to ride the North American rail network. A pair of striking photographs by Mike Brody give us an opportunity to engage directly with the persistence of freight train riders whose mobility is tied to an economic system they're outside of. And yes, we do touch on graffiti too. Next is life in the Rust Belt, a place near and dear to my heart from the eight years that I lived in Cleveland, Ohio which is the location of this Jeff Browse photograph that opens the section. And here we recall that the Rust Belt was once the Steel Belt, then the beating heart of the North American rail network. And we examine their relationship, their rise and fall, and how life there continues while the trains keep on rolling. Richard Jordan III takes us inside Buffalo Central Terminal with this photograph a great example of both changing traffic patterns as well as the challenges of urban renewal. And we conclude this segment with a bright sunrise over Pittsburgh, the nation's original steel city, which has reinvented itself in the 21st century and in which railroads continue to play a role, evidenced here by both CSX and Norfolk Southern main lines at lower right with an intermodal train uh, coming at you on the ladder. This is one of several Ben Sutton photographs in the book, and it's uh, certainly a treat to shine a light on his great photography. The next gallery is a brief but important consideration of Amtrak's Acela. Introduced in 2000, the Acela is the continent's only high-speed rail line, at least for now. <laughs> While it has had a rocky career, it has a linchpin of the staggering success of Amtrak's Northeast Corridor services which now carry more passengers than all air service between Boston, New York, and Washington, DC. Then there is Acela's cultural shadow. In shape and form and speed, we cannot now imagine a Northeast corridor that isn't fast and getting faster. While it may not have the staggering beauty of the first Shinkansen photographed by Hirota, it is clear that the Acela deserved a place in our book. Moreover, this section gave us a chance to showcase some of our talented photographers in the Northeast, including Eric Williams, whose photo is seen here, and Dennis Livesey, whose 2019 picture from the Bronx also includes the New York subway and provides a great visual for discussing the challenges of moving ever larger numbers of people on ever older infrastructure of the Northeast corridor. This is another of the book's eight foldouts, which includes an extended caption on the reverse. So a contrast here, uh, after a seller's urbanity, we now move to hometown railroading in a segment that considers the past and current presence of railroads in small towns across the nation. This was an important topic for the book and we're grateful for uh, Eric Williams again to help make it possible with several strong photographs in this section including this one from Bangor, Pennsylvania. Here we focus on small towns in the countryside, on the pastoral landscapes that so many rail lines traverse. These are often still places where the relationship between the railroad and the North American landscape remains deeply entangled and seemingly harmonious. Now, the example here is a 2013 panorama of the Washington County Railroad in St. Johnsbury, Vermont by Ian Clark. And here the passing train remains as much a part of the place as does the stately farmhouse, the red barn, 
and the Timeless Forests. I was the primary author of the essay for this section, and I opened with an experience that surprised me when it happened. Uh, this family, uh, using a pedestrian overpass to get over the busy BNSF main line in Alma, Wisconsin, actually stopped to watch the train when the little girl saw it approaching. So even though they had the overpass that provided a way of not having to wait for the train, they waited anyway. From a time when railroads were central to small town life, they are now almost an otherworldly presence. Yet it's a presence that still wields the power to fascinate from rail fans to the general public. And that leads us to our next section, a commemoration of Amtrak's first 50 years. Against all odds, countless critics and numerous challenges of economics, politics, and culture, Amtrak has grown substantially over the past half century and its trains remain a vital connection linking friends and families such as this, such, me, such as we see here um, in this wonderful Chris Gopal photograph, hi Chris, um, of loved ones meeting in Laurel, Mississippi, a station stop on the Crescent. Stacy Evans keeps us focused on people with this view of her husband on the Coast Starlight from her project Passenger, which we featured here at the center in a Zoom presentation last fall. And of course, the trains themselves get some well-deserved play in this gallery too, including this beautiful Enrique Contreras photograph of the starlight rolling down the coastline just before sunset. Old Familiar Faces is the one title that we lifted directly from Baroda's book. At its heart are the long-term survivors. Some, such as Iowa Traction's Baldwin Electric Locomotives, seen in this photograph by Lawrence Perlman, are over a century old now, and yet continue to be a part of the commercial rail network. Others are preserved and heritage equipment, uh, rolling museums that tug at the national taste for nostalgia. For photographers, this results in a variety of responses. Many strive to recreate the past, such as this scene by Dan Drennan of a preserved steam locomotive, the Southern Pacific 4449 in Portland, Oregon. Preserved locomotives continue to draw on the general public, including those too young to have any experience of the world from which they hail, and yet they still appeal, such as in this Justin Franz photograph of two technologies colliding, where a Gen Zer, probably born in the late 1990s, takes a selfie on his smartphone with his 1941 built Union Pacific 4014, another preserved and operating steam locomotive in Ogden, Utah in 2019. In a sense, what we see here is not only the appeal of heritage trains extending to new generations, but also how photography remains central to our culture's interest in railways, even as our means of those photographs change radically. I just have to add here that there's such great commentary in Justin's photograph. Uh, in the background, we have the older photographers focused entirely on the locomotive and shooting with DSLR cameras. And then they're contrasted to the younger man here in the foreground shooting a selfie with his smartphone. And yet, regardless of all those differences, the big boy is the draw for all of them. And, and by the way, that sequence is exactly as it is in the book, though the, that when they follow each other like that. Um, so I, over the last 20 years, uh, Heritage has also been unusually appealing to the major railroad corporations themselves. Uh, as powerfully illustrated by this grid of portraits by Norfolk Southern's Casey Thomason left, opposite a John Troxer photograph of a Wabash Heritage unit on the right. But veteran equipment and museum pieces and tribute paint schemes are just a part of this story, as many photographers can attest. In many places, the infrastructure built for another age remains integral to daily service and a compelling subject for photographers such as this D. Matias image of Pennsylvania's Altoona shops built nearly a century ago, but still maintaining and rebuilding contemporary locomotives for Norfolk Southern. How long will such survivors last? For photographers, there's an ever-present fear that it may already be twilight. For these former Santa Fe signals on New Mexico's Breton Pass, it certainly seems so in 2018 when Brian Bechtold photographed them. 
The fear of imminent loss alongside the desire to relive the past remains a potent contradiction-laden motivation for photographers in this century as well as it did in the last. Well, this next section, uh, which we call International Exchange, is the one that might require the most explanation in a book that professes to be about North American railroading. But of course, our railroads do not exist in a vacuum. They are parts of global supply chains, as well as conduits for ideas, technology, and innovation. And much like people, I believe the railways of the world are more alike than they are different. We lead off here with a concrete example of international exchange. This is a George Hamblin photograph of General Electric locomotives built in the US, but heading for export to Angola. And commodities cross oceans as well. Uh, this defeat Wiles photograph shows a power plant in England that burned coal from the US with rail transport in both countries bookending its transatlantic journey by Collier. Now the Steve Patterson photograph from Austria appears to be entirely foreign at first glance. And I know for those of you who uh, know Steve, that's not Joe McMillan dressed up there. Uh, this is an Austrian man in traditional Tyrolean dress, drinking Austrian beer aboard an Austrian Federal Railways train while watching the green mountains of Tyrol pass through the windows of the dining car. He might be Austrian through and through, but how different is he really from the American in a flannel shirt and cowboy boots drinking cores while rolling through Colorado on the California Zephyr? We conclude this section with three Jean-Marc Freiburg photographs from Peru, where American investment in the form of Henry Posner III's Railroad Development Corporation helps keep the trains running over the Andes Mountains. Most of the locomotives here are second generation American models, and the men who maintain them have quite a bit in common with their counterparts in US diesel shops from Altoona to North Platte. And this is a fitting transition to our next section, the look of work, which focuses specifically on the visual appearance of the railroad worker in the 21st century. William Beecher opens this gallery with his view of CN conductor Mike Cook sporting his high visibility vest during a nocturnal roll, excuse me, nocturnal roll by in Ackerville, Wisconsin. This is an era defined by the so-called high vis colors by fluorescent orange and yellow and green by 3M reflective tape. Yet old traditions die hard in the railroad world. And the American cultural icon of the locomotive engineer is in many ways evergreen. Seen here, for example, is Scott's view of Lou Thielen on the Portland and Western, still rocking traditional bibs and a pocket watch underneath his modern rain jacket. This is not to say that technology has not changed the industry. Uh, or the nature of labor in the industry. Uh, remote control operations are a prime example of this. In this spread with photographs by me, Ross Harrison at the lower left, and Kyle Weissman Yee on the right, such technologies make the human aspects of railroading harder and harder for photographers to access. After all, in this century, there are simply fewer railroads per, excuse me, fewer railroaders per train. Uh, how much further this trend will we shape the human aspects of the railroad world remains an open and contested question. Before we move on, I just want to share a couple of my favorite photographs from this section as well, uh, including this one of Metro Carmen Tommy Positano uh, by a Metro photographer, Mark Lanuza, in a view that speaks to both the pandemic and uh, these wonderful Chicago winters we enjoy in the Midwest. And then there's this great uh, in the cab shot by Hank Kashalik uh, featuring Nate Mazo on the Cleveland Harbor Belt. And finally, this just extraordinary winter composition by Brian Bechtold on the Kyle Railroad in Colorado. And the colors and lines of this shot are just breathtaking to me. But in this century, the most likely human being that a photographer will encounter on an American railroad is probably a commuter not a worker, or at least not a railroad worker. The world of the railway commuter is thus the focus of our next section. Even during and after the COVID-19 pandemic that struck while we were editing this book, uh, trains remain integral to urban life. In a nod to the location of New York's Grand Central Terminal, uh, arguably the continent's most important transit station, 
uh, we call this section the rhythm of 42nd Street. And we open with a George Hyotis photograph from Queens. And then go inside of Grand Central itself with this beautifully lit view by Emily Moser, showing the Great Hall on a typically busy morning before COVID. And then on the following spread, another of Emily's views showing the same place, ghostly empty at the height of the pandemic. Should have the next slide. I've advanced that it might just be a delay. There we go. Um, from the commuter trains at the high iron, as this view of Metro commuter train by Mike Rea left, to the lightest of light rail, such as this view of the Portland streetcar by Kyle, excuse me, Kyle Weissman Yee on the right. Um, railways are not only integral to the life of American cities, but increasingly they're a place where photographers as well as the general public encounter trains the most. From the intimacy of commuter operations, we pull way back with our next to last gallery where we consider what is possibly the most distinctive characteristic of North American railways, their reduction of time and space through their crossing of what we call the expanse. Todd Halamka leads off this section with this surreal and yet completely real view of Wyoming. Few photographers shooting today are as good as Todd when it comes to um, conveying the sense of scale of railroads and the landscape. But one that definitely gives him a run for his money is Rick Malo uh, with this painterly light at the Wilcox Playa in Texas. Uh, Rick seems uh, seemingly captures the entirety of the American West, the ongoing allure of railroading there in this stunning photograph. And then here's Todd again <laughs> with a night and day diptych from a place dear to Scott's heart, Hawk's Nest in West Virginia in the New River Gorge. This is another of the fold outs in the book, by the way. And trust me, we worked hard to make that fold exactly where the divide was between those pictures. And there are a few photo uh, photographs, excuse me, that uh, we just really wanted to use in this book, um, like this 2020 image by Scott of the comet Neowise above the Mississippi River and the BNSF mainline near Galena, Illinois. It brings a close the gallery of the expanse. Um, I should pause and note that in the index, there's a lot of photographs by Scott. Um, I know this is, embarrasses him a little bit. Um, I can say, however, this was my doing and not his. Uh, he gave me almost full autonomy to pick or discard anything he contributed in favor of other submissions. And when you're an editor and you're faced with a photograph like this, you run it. Um, you just do. And that also is a bit of the DNA of the book itself. The story comes first. And in the expanse, the story is very much about this relationship between the railways and this vast, dark, and foreboding distance in the North American landscape. In this case, no other photo would do. You're kind, Alex. Thank you. And I, I wish you could have heard uh, Maureen's reaction from the other room as you just shared that. I don't think she was aware of this little addition to the program. <laughs> So our, our final section is fittingly what we call uh, departures and arrivals. And we intentionally flip the typical order of that pair of words. So much of railroad photography focuses on what is about to disappear. Yet you know, while we try to stay one step ahead of the wrecking ball as railroad photographers, we also follow closely behind the excavator as we document and portray <laughs> what's new. And sometimes you can even do both in the same photograph as Kyle Weissman Yee did here. And this is an old locomotive on a new railroad, the Coos Bay Rail Link in Western Oregon, which in 2011 reactivated a branch line that had been out of service for the past four years. And in many ways, this section both encapsulates and completes the book. So we're going to show you a little bit more from this chapter than we did from the others. We say a lot of recent goodbyes in this gallery. Some were kind of surprising such as the recent scrapping of the Amtrak Cascades Talgo train sets, which had seemed so modern and futuristic when they debuted. The image on the left is Lou Capwell's, shot during a ferry move to the scrappers. On the right is my own photo of one of these trains rolling up the Willamette Valley in the better days. Some other goodbyes were a long time coming. 
This is Alex's 2010 photograph of the Portland and Western's former Bailey branch at Dawson, Oregon, three years after it closed, with its replacement quite prominent at right on the highway. It was in some ways a small miracle that this line had survived into this century at all in serving just one customer, the last steam-powered sawmill in the country. And other goodbyes were expected, but no less affecting including this former Pennsylvania Railroad Tower at Galitzin, Pennsylvania, in photographs by Jeff Browse on the left and Jeff Mast on the right. Or to these recently retired and fallen Burlington searchlight signals at Ancona, Illinois, in a somber view by Christian Schrader. And I should add that the photographer, I think, was in the fourth grade when he took this picture. What a sad, but fabulous composition. And then there are the transitions, examples less of decline than maybe of evolution or metamorphosis. Uh, this pair of photographs by Dennis Livesey shows one of the more unusual examples, the conversion of the former New York Central elevated freight line on Manhattan into a linear set of public gardens known as the High Line. Or the arrival of new electric equipment from the Swiss builder Statler destined at long last to fulfill Edward Harriman's dream of electrifying San Francisco's commutes, as seen in this photograph by Chip Sherman. Or the arrival of new locomotives and locomotive technologies, such as these gen sets on the Union Pacific, while diesel switchers, now four decades old, uh, struggle on with their last assignments, as seen in these two photographs by Kyle Weissman Yee. And I should pause to note that while we were producing um, this presentation, uh, Locomotive 3613, which is here on the right, was the last in-cab diesel switcher on BNSF. And as if to illustrate how change was still upon us, just last week, BNSF donated it to the Oregon Rail Heritage Center for preservation. So on the 21st Century Railroad, sometimes departures are also arrivals. And now we're both old enough to have photographed to preserve locomotive in regular service. <laughs> and we also celebrate the new in this book, including New York City's shiny Moynihan train hall, which replaced a cramped Penn Station that I don't think any of us miss uh, in this Emily Moser photograph. And this is the last photograph in the book, one that both Alex and I knew we had to include even before we began sol soliciting submissions. And I'll end our formal remarks this evening by directly quoting on my last paragraph from the essay here. We close this volume with a composition that might seem confusing at first. In the lush greenery of a California agricultural field and beneath a brooding sky, an Amtrak train passes, blurred slightly, through what at first glance may appear to be a half-finished highway overpass that could be more of a distraction than a framing element. Look again. That is no highway, but a support structure for California's high-speed rail line. Both visionary and controversial, the project faces a future that is far from secure at the time of this writing. Regardless of the outcome, though, L. Ron Lawrence's photograph is the perfect coda to this visual exploration of continuity and change within North American railroading. In its half-finished state, that overpass stands as a temporary monument to what might be, reminding us that these changes are ultimately our continuity. Thank you all so much for the chance to share this book with you this evening. It is available on our website for $65 uh, plus $9 in shipping. Remember, it weighs six and a half pounds, and we'll begin mailing out copies on September 1st. Uh, maybe Haley, you could drop a link in the chat window for the uh, direct uh, link to buying the book. And I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share at this point. Uh, Alex and I have a couple of questions for each other to open up the Q&A. And then if any of you have questions for us, we'll be glad to take those as well. I, I think you had more for me than I had for you. So I do. Yeah, I have, I'll, uh, I'll lead off here. Uh, and so, you know, Alex, I know you handled the initial image submissions and selections. Uh, 
to my great gratitude as I was a little busy running some other things at the center. Um, and I wonder if you could say a little bit about your thought process as you made some of those initial editorial passes and whittling down those 3,000 images we got uh, to the you know, several hundred that you ultimately brought to me for final consideration. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, the, the having that structure of the galleries before that process started was helpful. Um, because again, it's like, you know, this is supposed to be a, a group of photographs that is mostly around this idea of this sort of journalistic and commercial traditions. Those are traditions in which a story is being told. So what's the story, right? So the story through those galleries helped create lumps that things could fit into. And that, of course, meant that there were times when I might have too many of something, a lot of great stuff, but there's just too many that are doing the same thing. So I had to start picking, right? And um, so in some cases, I was trying to find a way to get as much variety of photographers as possible, because another goal of this is, I mean, it's not just the kindness of spreading love, it's also about trying to show the variety of perspectives, right, to try to show a big cross section of what's going on out there, try to show a geographic cross section of what's going on out there too, which was really tricky. Um, that, that got really tough in some, ca some cases when there wasn't enough material, because maybe we just didn't have enough submissions from like, the southeast for example that was really it was always really tough to find stuff from the south um so it was really about letting the story lead the way yeah. and trying to be as as broad based as possible who was in it but as you well know by the time i made the first share to you um I mean, what was it it was like 600 pages or something <laughs> like it was it was absurd like there were still way too many images right <laughs> Um, well, no, I mean, that's a great testament to, to, I think, the incredible talent of our community. I mean, we, we literally could throw out the 230 photographs that are in the book, put a different 230 photographs in, and still have a fantastic book. It would be a different book, but it would still be visually compelling and stunning and beautiful. And, you know, I think that speaks to the difficulty of the challenges you know, of, the, of the decisions we faced, and, and also, again, just to that incredible wealth of material that's out there. Yeah, it might have had to have different named galleries and different things sure. together or something. Yes, yeah, know? yes. Uh, but you know, you're you're just lucky you didn't end up with a book that was all Oregon all the time. So you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't have complained too much about that having lived there for a while. <laughs> so uh, I mean, I guess that that leads to the question I had for you, which is, you know, um, one of the premises of the book is it's 21st century railroading, it's 21st century photography. I don't think of books when I think of the 21st century. I think of the internet. I think of where we are right now. I think of digital photography and drones and internet sharing and Instagram and et cetera, et cetera. So why a book? What, what is the value of a book for, for anyone, for the person who's looking at it, for the photographer who's participating in it, for the center that's producing it? I mean, starting purely from a selfish standpoint, I just, really like books and I, I like making books. Um, but I, you know, I grew up in West Virginia and the valleys there are deep and the mountains form boundaries. So I, I like boundaries and I, I like the structure that and the boundaries that a book provides. It's a comfortable space for me. And, and I think it's a fun challenge to, to make something fit and to make it sing and, and really a pleasure to work with you and our designer Jeff on putting it together. Um, and, and I think there's something to be said for these these kinds of boundaries and structure today. I mean, we live in a world that is utterly awash in electronic imagery. And I like to think that our work of curating and then presenting the images that appear in this book might provide at least a little bit of value for people trying to navigate the millions upon millions of railroad photographs in existence. And beyond that, I also think there's something to be said for taking digital images and giving them physical form. It, it's a way of making them a little bit more tangible and tactile. And then given the uncertainty of digital, digital preservation, it might even help preserve some of them a little bit longer. Yeah, I was just reminded of something I wrote at the end of After Promontory when we did the special issue in Railroad Heritage about how many photos go on Instagram. I um, mean, I just looked up the most recent numbers um, four million images an hour. <laughs> um, you know, how do you keep up with even 1% of that? Um, 
and I, and I also have to think too, like, and as you well know, I mean, the center is an archival organization. The, the difficulty of archiving digital material is it's not less difficult than physical material. No. It's different, but it's not less difficult. Um, and it has its own constraints and problems. And I feel like there's a good possibility that some of the photographs that are in this book over my shoulder will outlast in this book the actual image file. Um, so to some degree, I, you know, I think when we were talking about this before, it's like, in a way, maybe the book is almost like an extension of the archival work that Center is doing, because you kind of created an archive here of what's going on right now. Yeah, I'd like to think so. And I'd still like to think we can figure out digital preservation a little bit better too, but it certainly remains a, a challenge. And certainly it's a more active form of preservation, I think, than, than physical photographs. I mean, you're Constant always- Constant migration, be, right? Not, yeah. not just shoving it in a, in a bridge somewhere in a dark space, you know? No, no, even the best hard drives and solid state media can fail over time. Uh, so a final question for you, and then we'll gladly open it up to anybody else. Um, but, you know, over, the course of publishing both this book and our last one, uh, The Railroad and the Art of Place and Anthology, I've, I've, I've realized that there's really quite a lot of overlap in, in these two schools of photography that we talk about, these two books representing. And I've, I've kind of come to see them as, as not so much two different schools, but really two ends of the same spectrum with honestly a whole lot of gray in between. Um, even so, I probably put my work more one end of the spectrum and yours may be a little bit more at the other uh, from might be a little bit more fitting in, in uh, the art of place book and, and so just with that background I'm curious as to what specifically appealed to you about working on this book project um, I mean first off my passage into making photog photographs of railroads and such was from looking at books like Passion for Trains by Dick Steinheimer, you know, edited by Jeff Browse, um, uh, looking at Ted Benson's photographs, looking at Blair Coyster's photographs, looking at regional books that had photographs that were by people who were shooting Kodachrome in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you know, Colin Johnson, et cetera. In fact, I think I saw um, on a Facebook post uh, yesterday that um, Kyle was crediting Colin Johnson with having inspired him to get into the photography of, of trains, right? So, I mean, this kind of work was my gateway into this subject matter. Um, so I have a love for it. And I, I think sometimes we confuse what people do with what people like. And I think that your taste can be broader than what you do yourself. You know, I cannot cook Chinese food worth it, you know what, but I love it. You know, it's like, there's there's this sort of notion that you, that I, you know, this is stuff that's interesting to me. Um, the the other aspect of this too is, and, and as you well know, um, you know, for the last 10 years or so, um, I was in graduate school, I was getting a degree, I was getting hired a new job. I mean, I'm, I'm live from my office right now on the Cal campus. So that's why it's slightly echoey because there's not enough sound deadening on these horrible concrete walls. But, um, but regardless, it's like, I have not made probably more than 100 photographs of anything rail related in the last 10 years. I just haven't at the time. So for me, there was a curiosity aspect too. I wanted to see what was going on. What were people doing? What were people making? How people changed things? Uh, for me, one of the most interesting things to chew on with this is, hey, all these late 20th century guys are the guys that really influenced me and made me interested in the work, but it's now 20 years into the 21st century. What is the 21st century like? Can we possibly start to see that yet? And so it was that opportunity to see what was going on. Um, but as for the spectrum thing, I mean, I, you and I had some conversations about this early on when we were editing this, right? Like, do, you know, will there be any dead track? You know, <laughs> that kind of thing, you know, there certainly is like, you know, so, you know, some of those are my photographs, but they're not all my photographs because, but that's part of the story too, right? And well, I, no, and I mean, I think we see great examples of, of, of that crossover and that spectrum. I mean, we certainly see it in our archives at the center. I mean, you know, right. we, we get to know photographers by their work that's been published in Trains Magazine and other places, you know, 50, 60 years ago, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, so many photographers have shot so richly and fully and, you know, far beyond what might just sell in a magazine article. And it's really, I mean, that's part of what I love what we do in our archival book at the center is getting to see more of, of 
kind of how photographers thought and what appealed to them and what they found worthwhile in preserving on cellulose acetate. And, and it's certainly a, a wider spectrum, I think, than, than you know, what we might necessarily associate with, with a lot of photographers. And so that's exciting to see and, and just kind of reinforces this notion that it's, it's, all, it's all just this great broad mm -hmm. spectrum and there's no really boxing in anyone anywhere. Which I think no, I, mean, I, I, I think I used the example with you before about talking about Blair Coister's photographs of the Milwaukee and, you know, and we think of like these, these iconic images of the black and white and the dying, you know, electrics and all the rest of the sort of stuff that we see in some of those, those um, stories that were published in magazines and things that were really influential, but also now more recently, you know, especially through digital technology, he's released images of like the railroad workers that worked at the Milwaukee as it was shutting down. And th those are also masterful photographs. And to me, I think it's almost like, it's not even that it's a spectrum. It's that this is like a conversation going on between these photographs. Mm -hmm. In many ways, that big emotional photo that shows you the train and the dramatic landscape is part of what gives you uh, the kind of emotional resonance of why this place was so different that then these people are so mourning their jobs being lost or the line being pulled up. That these are these are part of the same story. They're just different aspects of it, and and I think the lesson that it, that comes from that is shoot wide, shoot everything, right? Like it may not be something that an editor will pick for this moment in this particular use, but it will be useful. It will be valuable. It, it's part of the story. You know, just don't neglect any aspect of the story. Try to get as much as you can. So thankfully, those of you who are digital don't have to get a bunch of film and buy it for that purpose because that's really expensive. <laughs> well, Haley, rather than just listing us to prattle on with our own questions, do we have any for the audience? Oh, I'm enjoying your guys' very <laughs> animated back and forth. It's great. Um, I've actually been doing uh, this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> to kind of like uh, tack on to the conversation you already have going, um, Dennis Livesley asks an, an interesting question. Who is this book for? Hmm. Hmm. That's a great question. And, you know, I think as with a lot of our work at the center, we strive to hit a crossover audience. I mean, we certainly want to appeal to our, our core community of, of image makers. And so, I, you know, in, in some ways, I'd like to see this as sort of a photographer's photography book. Um, you know, but on the other hand, we also would hope that someone who might pick this up, hopefully in some general bookstore out there in the wide world, maybe Pals in Portland, Oregon, or some uh, photo eye out in New Mexico, or some of these great independent bookstores that we hope will stock this thing. You know, we hope that that a member of the general public could pick up this book and and appreciate it and and maybe even get some sense of, of what railroading is all about today. And, you know, I mean, for for most people, the experience of a train is a delay at a railroad crossing if there's an experience <laughs> of a train at all in, in people's lives. And you know, certainly that's part of the experience, but you know, I think there's a whole lot more to it. And you know, we hope that this book might might show them that. You know, whether that translates to sales or not, we'll we'll find out. But uh, you know, I, I think there's, I mean, just as you see at the Union Pacific steam events in recent years, I mean, the railroad still has a profound fascination on the public. And Hopefully this this book can convey at least a little bit of that. Anything on your end, Alex? Um, I'll just add that I think that that was part of the goal of the foldouts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember when Jeff said that, like, you know, we could put foldouts in this, and the two of us were almost like squeeing in the background over the idea, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I I kept thinking about like going into. I mean, I don't. I'm sure that a lot of people in the audience have done this. They go to their local store that has like used books, whatever, wherever that is. They might have to drive an hour to get to it. They might only have to drive ten minutes. You know, I was lucky enough to to spend most of my life where Powell's was, so I had that option. Um, but I remember going there all the time and and going to the section that had the railroad books and seeing what was there, seeing what they had bought from somebody, seeing what some estate sale had ended up in there, you know? <laughs> and it's funny, like some books just sit and sit and sit and nobody buys them and other books just move really fast. And I think as we were pulling this book together in the back of my mind, it was thinking like, this should be a book that is going to still be interesting to someone in 20 years, in 50 years. It's gonna be something someone's going to want for a long period of time even though it is about this brief moment, if you will, these two decades, it, 
hopefully will have a longer lifespan to it because of the quality of what's there and the the narrative structure that pulls it together um so yeah i, I think that it's it's not necessarily a book that requires you to know a bunch of stuff about trains no. um it's hopefully a book that if you already know a bunch of stuff it's still something you're going to enjoy and if you don't know anything about it you're going to learn something new you guys tell us a little bit about the cover photo <laughs> <laughs> well it's mine so i guess i should i should start i, I will add there that uh, uh we let as 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 one should do when working with a professional designer you let designers design and and you let them pick the cover photos and and uh jeff really wanted this one on the on the cover and i was honored for him to pick it uh this is logan west virginia uh on uh csx former chesapeake and ohio uh I mean, deep in the heart of Appalachian coal mining territory and only about 50 miles from where I grew up. And it's a, it's a mine run uh, coming back. This was a unit train that had loaded in two parts. And this is the second smaller part returning. And they'll reassemble it with the rest of the train at Peach Creek Yard and then head up to the CNO main line and go either east or west from there. I didn't have the symbol, so I'm not sure which direction it's heading. Uh, this was over the Christmas holidays of 2008. And it's a especially meaningful photograph for me because, um, you know, from probably the time I was 12 or 13, my, my grandfather would take me out looking for trains in West Virginia. You know, he drove at first before I got my license and then he helped teach me to drive. And then I, I did the driving and he rode along and I was really pleased at the times I could amaze him uh, places in West Virginia that even after 70 years, he'd never been to before. And that was a lot of fun. And so we did a lot of these trips, especially when I came back after I moved away, lived in Ohio and Japan and then uh, in Oregon. Uh, and so I'd always try to get out with grandpa for a day. And this was one of the last times he was able to come with me. And so it was really special to, to just you know be out with him and, and then to have this photograph used uh, as a kind of a reminder and a hallmark of that. And you know, a lot of people shy away from these gloomy days, but boy, the mist hanging over the mountains there is just music to my soul. And I was so glad to, to have this kind of conditions to photograph and find a train running down there that day. So oh, um, in both your, I guess, your own kind of photographic journeys, but also while putting together this book, um, can you speak to any anything that you've kind of come across that's inspired you to maybe change or expand your perceptions mm -hmm. um, of this field? I actually have one, so I'll start while you think a little bit more, Alex. Um, and again, Back to West Virginia, uh, one of the, the first further along photographers that I, I met and had a chance to shoot with is uh, Kevin Scamlin out of Pittsburgh, an absolutely extraordinary photographer. And we were out photographing a CSX branch line together out of the New River Gorge and it went by this waterfall that was kind of deeply buried in trees. And I thought it was a beautiful scene, but you know, there was no clear view of the tracks there. And I didn't even give it a passing thought for a railroad photograph. And you know, Kevin descends down the bank and, and down to the creek and, and comes away with this extraordinary photograph looking up through the tree branches. And, uh, and so that was kind of a, a, a mind altering moment. And then the New, the New River Gorge again is this, this place that is, is incredibly deep. It's an enormous landscape. The, the bluff tops are, or the, the, the cliff tops are 900 to 1000 feet above the river level. And you, know, you can stand up on the overlooks and use a telephoto lens to zoom in and see you know, a, a train with the tracks and maybe a little tiny bit of the river, but it doesn't do anything to convince to convey a sense of, of scale. And um, you know, I I wasn't really sure how to photograph this. I thought the trains were too small. And then again, I saw some of Kevin's photographs, and sometimes just just a headlight or a, a glint of the sun off a, a, the side of a locomotive or a hopper car was all you needed to provide that that railroad context, and then to place the the railroad in its greater environment. And I mean, this has happened to me with many photographers whose work I've been privileged to see, but Kevin's was, I think, one of the first that really kind of helped expand my thinking about what you could do with photography. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that the book necessarily changed how I think about photography or editing it changed anything in that regard, um, but I would say that it's probably made me feel a little guilty about what I've done with my own. <laughs> There's a box somewhere in storage 
with some really badly stored negatives that I really need to pay attention to. Um, and <laughs> I found our myself like, about this. What's that? Don't tell our archivist about this. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. She would she would freak out if she saw the way they look. Like some of them are still in, in like rolls that are just sort of like loose inside the box. And yeah, it's really bad. Um, but as I was looking at some of the photographs that came in, they reminded me of times that I had been out or or times that I had shot something similar. And they made me sort of feel a bit of nostalgia and and longing to see the photos again. Um, I'm not sure that it's going to spur me to go out and make a bunch more because when am I going to have time to do that? <laughs> that that's, that's the problem. I can't schedule such things. Um, but it is funny too, like it wasn't that long ago that that box of photographs was just, oh, photos I made recently. Um, you know, something that I did fairly recently and I just haven't gotten back to. And I think that looking at this book and doing 22 years worth of photographs, basically, in this book um, made me realize how quickly time passes. I mean, Scott, you joked earlier, it's like now we both can say that we have seen a locomotive in service that has been donated and, and you know, preserved, right? Um, that sneaks up on you. So everyone who is younger than us right now, shoot a lot and don't and take care of what you shoot. Because very quickly, you're going to wake up and realize you're not so young anymore. And you've got a lot of stuff that everyone's going to like, wow, they used to run that. <laughs> well, no, and another great admonishment there, too, is, you know, I mean, there's, there's, we've seen some wonderful then and now uh, re-photography presentations recently. And, you know, when you're young, that's the time to take your then photographs. You have to shoot then now to be able to go back and, and capture a, a later image down the road. And that can, I think, really help enhance your perspective and appreciation because you know then maybe it's not necessarily the drama of the train going by but it's the the complexity of the scene and the the infrastructure or how it relates to the landscape those those things that not just the trains themselves but everything around them that's going to change in the future and you know seeing being able to record that over 20 or 50 years sometimes can be really striking We have a few people asking already if you're going to make a second volume. <laughs> we know that question. Help, help, help us sell out of this one first, and then we'll ponder that question. <laughs> I, I mean, I will say that the photographs are not going to go to waste, right? Like, I mean, we'll probably find ways to use them in rare heritage or various other ways if we can, if you're interested. Um, because there is always more beautiful work than we could fit. Yeah. Um, and I would just also encourage you to like, start making your own projects. Yeah. Start pitching stories, you know, to us as well as other places. Absolutely. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. It's like, wow, I've never seen this person's work before. This is really interesting. You know, you should do more of this. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, again, I, I'd say this for, for everyone who didn't make it into the book, or if you did, but a favorite photograph of yours wasn't in it. I mean, it's, not at all that it's not a great photograph. It just wasn't necessarily the best fit that we felt for this particular project, but there are always other projects out there that need other photographs. And yeah, there's, there's always lots of opportunities for that. Um, so I can't, is there a section on heritage or tourist railroads in this book? And did you consider including that? If not, I can't quite remember in the... Index. Yeah, so Old Familiar Faces has the heritage stuff in there. Um, and there's more than we showed in tonight's, you know, in tonight's yeah, this was just a short overview. And, you know, we, we, we kind of take a broad view of heritage operations. I mean, showing the, certainly we include museum and tourist operations, restored steam locomotives, but we also wanted to look at some of the older steam era equipment that's still in service today, as well as the sort of the modern heritage phenomenon that, we, that mm -hmm. you showed, Alex, with the Norfolk Southern Heritage locomotives. Um, so, you know, I, I think we were really trying to focus more on, on contemporary freight and, and passenger from a revenue standpoint operations. Uh, but certainly we, you know, we, heritage operations are a big part of the story and, and something that we you know, made an intentional decision to include at least to some extent. And, you know, again, there will be other projects for other days that are going to focus a lot more on those. But again, it was something that we, we wanted to include here. Yeah, and there's some, there's a Justin Franz photograph, there's some work by Oren, 
Um, there's yeah, some Watch out some great temporary steam in there. Um, yeah, there's there's a beautiful Oren picture with the steam just going through the trees. Um, are you happy with the result? Now there there's the million dollar question, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> Well, are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was trying. I mean, I'm not unhappy with it. I was trying to think like, do I want two more photos? Is it too long? Does there need to be? A, I don't know. I can't think of anything that's nagging me that I'm like, oh, I really wish, you know, other than like, obviously, there's a limitation of how big a book can be yeah. um, to be practical, right? Um, but no, I mean, I'm I, I, okay, I, I will say this is not an unhappiness, but if I was going to add anything more, it would be like more essays because I loved writing the essays. That was really, really fun. And I think that Scott, you probably did too, because I know you love to write. No, I'm, I'm with you there. And it was such a, it was a great challenge, but a really rewarding challenge to try to write kind of in, in broader yet somehow specific terms about kind of the the current nature and role of the railroad in, in the North American continent, specifically the United States, but we do include some Canada and Mexico, uh, both as well, since they are so deeply connected. And yeah, it was, I mean, this is, this is the kind of writing I love to do, and it was great, wonderful to have an opportunity to do it. I'm gonna ask if this will become a traveling exhibit for the center. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> we got a few projects in the pipeline, so we'll have to we'll have to talk to our exhibitions coordinator about that one. <laughs> TBD. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, do you see? It looks like we're kind of running down on on questions. Um, any other ones you you want to answer, or do you want to start wrapping up? Well, I, I see there's some interest in, in what the next book is going to be. And, you know, again, uh, we're definitely hoping to uh, get some great traction out of this one first. We do have a couple of things uh, in the pipes, um, two, two projects specifically that we might say a little bit more about uh, before this year is, is out. Uh, but for, for now, um, buy this book, tell your friends to buy this book, uh, give this book as Christmas or holiday or birthday or any other uh, presents you can think of. Um, we, we, we did, a, I think we did a 1500 copy press run and, and we, sure hope, uh, we sure hope it goes fast and that we have to ponder the possibility of maybe even a second printing. That would be a wonderful, wonderful problem to have. Mm. Yes, it would. Oh, come on, you're not going to answer what the next book is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll tease that out on a, our, our, I think our, our marketing coordinator, uh, Mr. L. Ron Lawrence, is on here tonight. And I bet he would appreciate it if, if we had a separate opportunity to tease out uh, that <laughs> in a future presentation that we could market accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> Can't give away all of our secrets. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Alex, I want to say just again, what a great pleasure it was working on this with you. I mean, it, you know, I've, I've really appreciated our friendship over longer than I'd care to admit at this point, about <laughs> nearly half my life. Um, and, uh, but, but really, what a, what a great joy to collaborate on, on something that we're both so passionate about. And, and the fact that we could bring complementary but different perspectives to it, I think, is a great, um, you know, I think it helped think the, make a stronger book than either one of us could have done ind independently. Yeah, I, I don't think I would have wanted to do this alone. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm certainly not. laughs> yeah, and I, it's been a pleasure to do this um, and put this together. Um, and I, I really hope that everyone out there gets there, especially the contributors who've gotten their copies already. I hope you're really enjoying them. Um, I hope they live up to your expectations or exceed them. Yeah, and for all of I, you who have shared those on social media, thank you. That is some yes. of the stuff the best publicity and promotions we can receive. And that really means a lot to us. I mean, to see your your genuine enthusiasm uh, for the product and, and those organic shares on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and elsewhere really, really mean the world to us. So thank you for that. And, and thank you to everyone who managed to take out some time to come here to hear us blather about this book. So, <laughs> and, and thanks again to everyone who submitted work for it. I mean, we could not have done it without all of you and and thank you for making our lives as editors very difficult those are those are the challenges that you want to have when you're working on a project like this 
Uh, and you know, I, I will say for future books, we've got a lot of great archival work that we're doing right now. Um, we have some big collections that we're in the middle of or just getting started on, and I think they might fuel some some future book projects. But we want to get through those, uh, you know, really fully process them to be able to look deeply and completely at them before figuring out what to do with them. So that will definitely be something down the road. Certainly, no shortage of ideas. <laughs> no shortage of ideas. No shortage of material. Um, just wish there were a few more hours in the day or a few more days in the week or something. You know, I'll just add one thing. If you're opening the book and you see a photograph you love by someone you've never heard of, go find them on the internet, yes. Google them, like find yeah. the rest of their work and even send them a note and say, hey, I saw your, your picture and it was beautiful. You know, we're getting accolades and it feels great, but all of the photographers in this book should also, you know, get that if you can. So, you know, a lot of them we reached out to in that way, or we've had conversations with in some fashion. So spread the love because, you know, nothing feels better than getting the notes is like, hey, I saw your photo. It's really great. Definitely. All right. Otherwise, thanks for coming. <laughs> and uh, we'll see, uh, hopefully see you back on September 20th for our next uh, Zoom presentation. And again, that'll be our award winners. You can see them on our website and in the next issue of Railroad Heritage. Uh, congratulations to uh, Christopher J. May and uh, Ray Lewis for taking first place in the black and white and color categories. Uh, again, uh, I think we had a record number of entrants this year. Uh, you made our judges' lives very difficult as well. And uh, it'll be fun to hear directly from uh, the photographers. I think we'll have most of the first, second, and third place photographers from those categories for that. Mm -hmm. So again, September 20th, uh, we'll have registration information up on the website soon. And uh, we'll have some more programming uh, down the stretch for the rest of the year and, and into next. Yep. Yeah, got lots of good stuff planned ahead. Thanks again for joining us and uh, we'll see you again soon. Keep keep up the great photography out there. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thanks, everybody.